a dark lord wiped out by CGI, a heavyweight star saved from death in the ring, a martial arts icon replaced by a cardboard cutout. These are the fight scenes that didn't go as planned, for better or for worse. Technically speaking, Game of Death was Bruce Lee's final film. Released posthumously, it tells the story of martial arts star Billy Lowe, who must fake his own death to find out who's trying to kill him. Around 40 minutes of footage were shot before Lee passed away in 1973, but when the movie was finally released in 78, only 11 of those minutes actually made it into the film. Sadly, this means that most of the fight scenes featured throughout the movie didn't involve Lee at all. Enter the Dragon director Robert Klaus was the man brought in to finish the movie after Lee's death, and he spent most of his time finding inventive ways to not show Lee's character. Several doubles filled in for the fight scenes, including martial artist Yuan Biao, who had previously doubled for Lee in Enter the Dragon. As for the rest of the movie, most of the time Lee's character is wearing disguises, hiding in the shadows, or has his face obscured. One scene infamously includes a cardboard cutout of Lee's face pasted on a mirror. Most importantly, nearly every fight scene features a different actor pretending to be Lee, and it's painfully obvious too. Nobody can quite move like Lee, and it's clearly impossible to replace a bona fide martial arts legend. One of the most frequently discussed scenes in Quentin Tarantino's Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is the fight scene between Bruce Lee and Cliff Booth. The two square off in a two out of three falls fight. Lee picks up the first knockdown. Booth picks up the second, but they're interrupted before they can finish their match. However, this wasn't the fight scene planned in the script. In fact, the scene played out this way because all parties involved held Lee in too high of a regard. The third fight was originally going to be much longer and more competitive, with Cliff picking up the victory via a cheap shot. The goal wasn't to show Lee as weak, though. It was to show how Booth operated and made him more credible as a fighter for the audience. It is, after all, the first time we see Booth throw down in the movie, and it's arguably his only fight against someone trained for one. However, Brad Pitt and stunt coordinator Robert Alonzo had reservations about Lee losing, given his hollowed place in entertainment history. Alonzo had Pitt and Mike Moe trained for months on the scene, trying to find a way for Lee to lose without tarnishing his image. Tarantino eventually decided to have them interrupted, with no winner declared. The climax of The Lord of the Rings The Return of the King finds Aragorn facing off against a giant cave troll during the big battle outside the Black Gates. It's a pretty great fight, but it's hardly the main attraction. That's probably because this scene wasn't in the source material, wasn't originally shot that way, and, most importantly, wasn't supposed to happen at all. When wrapping up the trilogy, the creative team behind The Lord of the Rings had two thoughts. First, Sauron needed to appear in some physical form besides the Great Eye. Second, Aragorn needed to fight Sauron in some way in order to fulfill his personal journey. That's why an entire sequence was scripted, storyboarded, and shot in which Sauron shows up before the Army of the West. A blinding white light appears, and Sauron appears as Anatar, the angelic form he took when he tricked the elves into making the Rings of Power before taking his true form and fighting Aragorn. But the filmmakers soon realized this scene just wasn't working. It detracted from Sam and Frodo's struggle in Mordor and undermined Aragorn's role as a self-sacrificing military leader. It also looked like a clunkier fight than they originally wanted. And we thought, what's a, a worthy foe for Aragorn if it's not going to be Sauron? And we thought, well, a, a, a troll, a big, mean, armored troll. They later repurposed the footage so that Aragorn would go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the massive troll resulting in an epic battle of fantastical proportions. In a movie full of striking battle scenes, one of the most striking of all in Avengers Endgame was the fight between Hawkeye and Black Widow, in which the two come to blows over who will sacrifice themselves in order to acquire the Soul Stone. Basically, this scene brought the superhero concept of self-sacrifice to its literal and logical endpoint. It was also never in the script, and only came about in reshoots when the original version was already in the can. The scene, as originally shot, had Thanos' army show up at Vormir, leading to a small battle between them and the two Avengers. 
During the showdown, Natasha runs for the cliff while Clint tries to stop her and fight off the attack at the same time. The scene tested well with audiences, but new ideas began to form by the time reshoots started. As such, the filmmakers reshot the scene to make it more intimate, helping to better serve Natasha's character. It's hard to talk about Dark Phoenix without discussing the movie's endless reshoots and the controversy that followed. Big chunks of the second and third act were changed during production, including no fewer than two fight scenes being wholesale reworked. One of these scenes was changed because it was too similar to another superhero movie. One of the most hyped moments in Dark Phoenix was a climactic attack on the United Nations building in New York. Local media in Montreal shared pictures of the set, and reports implied that Jessica Chastain's character was a Skrull who would be part of the assault. By the time Dark Phoenix hit theaters, however, the attack was nowhere to be found. The scene was replaced by a much smaller scale fight on a train likely shot on a soundstage. The United Nations attack was also supposed to feature a space battle culminating in a full-blown alien invasion of Earth. This was scrapped because, according to James McAvoy, there was too much overlap with a certain other superhero movie. Considering the nature of the scene and the timing of the movie, it seems likely that the movie in question was Captain Marvel. That's why the scene was replaced with the battle on the train, a smaller scale sequence that didn't exactly do the film any favors. The Terminator series has always been renowned for its special effects, winning a ton of awards and acting as the launching pad for a new generation of special effects artists. Terminator Genesis took this to the extreme by featuring a fight scene created entirely with two CGI T-800s. I've been waiting for you. The battle at Griffith Observatory between the two T-800s was featured prominently in the movie's trailers. However, the filmmakers weren't crazy about the scene after they'd already finished filming. The production company wanted the battle to be more brutal than originally shot, but instead of flying in Arnold Schwarzenegger and the rest of the crew in for an expensive reshoot, they added to the fight scene using two completely digital governators. The added scenes were far more violent, and they certainly would have been difficult to pull off with human actors. The production team also used molds from the original 1984 Terminator movie to make doubly sure the younger T-800 was accurate. Rogue One A Star Wars Story ends with Darth Vader single-handedly slaughtering a hallway full of rebel soldiers before the plans for the Death Star narrowly escape his grasp. It's a brutal one-sided fight scene, especially by Star Wars standards. It also wasn't in the movie's original script. Rogue One attracted a lot of attention for its reshoots, even though they're relatively common in Hollywood blockbusters. In fact, reshoots are often built into a movie's production schedule. Nevertheless, those utilized on Rogue One were extensive even by industry standards. The original plan here was to have the Death Star data get to Leia via a handoff process with Vader following in pursuit. Of course, the filmmakers decided at the last minute to add a little kick to it, and they added the scene in which Vader actually boards the ship. The result? Nothing less than pure terror. Rocky V finds the titular hero retired from boxing due to brain damage and out of money due to financial mismanagement. He takes young fighter Tommy Gunn under his wing, but the whippersnapper slowly becomes resentful of his mentor. The film ends with Gunn and Balboa having a street fight in which Rocky is roughed up but ultimately wins. This victory wasn't supposed to happen though, and the original ending was much darker. For most of the production, the planned ending was for Rocky to die in the street fight. He would take a great beating from Gunn and then die on the way to the hospital in Adrian's lap. She would then hold a press conference telling the crowd that the spirit of Rocky lives on in people who believe in themselves. Director John G. Avildsen thought it was a perfect ending, and Stallone himself felt sick writing it. A few weeks into shooting, however, the studio called Avildsen and forced him to change it. Their reasoning? Heroes don't die. As such, the fight scene was changed. Adelson thought that the new ending hurt the movie, though, telling 94WIP that Rocky didn't die, but the movie died, because that was the point of the movie. 
Raiders of the Lost Ark is widely considered one of the greatest adventure films of all time. Part of its success is attributed to Harrison Ford's Indiana Jones, who established himself as the ultimate swashbuckling adventure hero and one who isn't afraid to play dirty. Indeed, one of his most iconic fight scenes from Raiders of the Lost Ark was also one of the most simplistic. As a swordsman spins his weapons around in an impressive and terrifying display, Jones takes the easy way out and does this. <laughs> this hilarious battle is fondly remembered by fans of the film. But it wasn't how the scene was originally intended to play out. In a Reddit AMA, Ford revealed the reason for the change, saying, I was suffering from dysentery, really, and found it inconvenient to be out of my trailer for more than 10 minutes at a time. We'd done a brief rehearsal of the scene the night before we were meant to shoot it, and both Steve and I realized it would take two or three days to shoot this. Since he wasn't feeling well and he had already done a major scene against several villains before that, Ford proposed to Spielberg that he just shoot the swordman. Spielberg agreed, and movie history was made. Ah, uh, Justice League, the internet's biggest talking point ever since comic book movies became the next big thing. The many stories of Warner Brothers' interference in the production are legendary, with director Zack Snyder stepping away due to personal tragedy and the studio drafting Joss Whedon to practically remake the whole movie in his stead. While Mustache Gate dominated most of the headlines, there was one particularly iffy action scene, shot by Whedon, that didn't feature in Snyder's original cut. Right at the start of the film, Batman uses a thief as bait to draw out a parademon. The scene became known as something of a joke due to Batman openly saying Alfred's name, possibly exposing his secret identity. What was that? A scout. From space. Funnily enough, the original scene was even more Whedon-esque. Holt McCallany, who played the thief, told Men's Journal, My scene with Batman was originally conceived as a comedic scene. That's how Joss wrote it, and that's how he shot it. I thought it came out great, but the studio felt it would be a mistake to open the film with a completely comedic scene, so it was re-edited a little bit. According to McCallany, Whedon sent him a bottle of champagne and a note as an apology for the studio's changes. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite movies are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.